Welcome back to the auditorium, everyone. Today we have a snow drift design example for you to get ready for the upcoming PE and SE exam. And remember, if you enjoy learning about civil and structural engineering and expanding your knowledge, consider subscribing down below. We'd love to have you join this team. It's growing larger, I mean, every single day. And if you like what we got going on here and everything that we have supplied in today's video, leave a like, it helps the channel tremendously. So thanks for helping out the little guy and I'll see everybody in there. Uh, good old question 103. All right, the figure shows an essential facility that is located in a sheltered area. Already two juicy bits of info. Essential facility, sheltered area. The design codes that you would need to use if you were stationed here in the United States would be the IBC or the International Building Code. This is an outdated problem. So instead of the 2012 edition, we have the 2018 edition. And we'd also be using the complementary ASCE 716 uh, provisions or the minimum design loads for buildings and other structures. Again, it wouldn't be the 2010, it would actually be the 2016, which is called typically the ASCE, if I can spell, 716. Design data, ground snow load is 30 PSF, so P sub G. Now this problem does come directly from an SE practice exam that I was thumbing through and working on, um, but you can apply this directly to your PE and towards your overall progression as a design engineer in your field. So this is for everyone. Well, first off, we're gonna be diving straight over into the ASCE 716, chapter one. I'll meet you in there. All right, here we are, chapter one of the 716, table 1.5-2 is where we're at, which is importance factors for risk categories of buildings and other structures for snow, ice, and earthquake loads. Well, we're here for snow only. Um, and the kicker here is that you need to know, well, what is our risk category um, for our building? And it didn't specifically say that, but it did say that this is an essential facility that we are designing for. Um, something like a fire station or a police station or a hospital where they need to be operational um, post, you know, catastrophic event. Um, which means that they fall under a risk category of four. So with that information, you have four, and for snow, importance factor I sub S, that means we need to use a factor of 1.20. That's all we needed from chapter one. Now, for the remainder of this problem, we're gonna jump over to chapter seven, which is our snow load chapter. See you in there. Here we are. And if you scroll down on the first page here, you'll see uh, ground snow load piece of G. That was given to us, remember it was 30 PSF. And you'll see, well, a flat roof snow load. So you'd think, all right, we need this. And first off, let's knock this equation out to get us our flat roof snow load. And then from there, we'll work on drift, right? Well, hold the brakes, that's not actually the case. For drift, they're actually only asking for the height of the drift itself. Um, so that means we don't really need to find um, your design flat balanced roof snow load. Boy, that was a mouthful. If you were asked to find the cumulative height of the drift, then we would need to get into this. But we get to just cross that off right off the bat. So that's great. And you'll see that when we go to our drift calculations, we don't need any of this information. Um, we don't need any of our roof snow loads. So that's really great and something that's handy. That means we get to jump over to section 7.7, .7, drifts on lower roofs. That's exactly what we have. We have a taller building next to a lower building and we're having some type of drift patterns forming. And if we go one step further, that actually lands us all the design criteria and equations we need are contained in 7.7.1. There is a figure that is associated with this text because this text is kind of wordy and can be kind of confusing at times. So I wanna jump over quickly and show you the figure that this pertains to so that you can go side by side if need be. So here we are on page 62. This is that figure I was talking to you about. And from our actual problem, we need to find H sub D. That's, that's what we're tasked with finding. So back in 771, snow that forms drifts comes from a higher roof or with the wind from the opposite direction from the roof on which the drift is located. These two kinds of drifts, leeward and windward, are shown in figure 7.7-1. That's where we just were. The geometry of the surcharge load due to snow drifting shall be approximated by a triangle as shown in figure 7 seven dash two. Again, that's where we just were. L sub U, which is the length of the upper roof. There's H sub C, which is the height difference between the low roof and the high roof. 
Um, and we do actually have that info. So let's jump back and let's clarify that. L sub u is 100 feet. That's right there. H sub C, we have a 30 foot high tall building and then we have a 15 foot high short building. Ignore this parapet, this five foot parapet here. You don't get to include that in the difference of your roof heights. It's your roof height, okay? Not any accessories that or architectural features that go on them. And H sub D is our unknown. So we have two cases. We have leeward and we have windward. Let's start with leeward. That puts us right here. So for leeward drifts, the drift height H sub D shall be determined directly from figure 7.6.1 using the length of the upper roof, which is L sub U, L sub U, uh, and the snow importance factor of table 1.5-2, which we found to be 1.2. However, the drift height need not be taken uh, as larger than 60% of the length of the lower level roof. All right, well, that's an extra component there. Let's do the first part and then we'll unload the second part. So let's head to figure 7.6-1. We have a ground snow load of 30, which is this sucker right here. And L sub U is 100, so you choose this line. And then we just connect until we hit the line that we want and then we head over to the y-axis. And this y-axis, for those who can't see it, is h sub d, which is what we're looking for, over i sub s raised to the 0 0.5. That gets us, I would say, 3.2 on the y-axis. So let's go use that. So h sub d over i sub s, which we know is 1.2, but that is raised to the 0 0.5, is equal to 3.2 feet per that figure. Well, if we solve for h sub d, h sub d ends up equaling 3.5 feet. So there's your first condition. But there was that extra thing associated per the uh, 716, so let's check that out. So we'll erase a little bit here, I got a little carried away. However, the drift height need not be taken as larger than 60% of the length of the lower level roof. So the drift height, which is H sub D, doesn't need to be taken as larger than 60% of the length of the lower level roof. So let's jump back. The lower level roof length is 25 feet. I'd say HD min is what I'll call it, is equal to 0.65, because that's 65% of the length of the low roof, which is 25 feet. That equals 16.25 feet, shoot, sorry, not minimum, HD max, which is clearly much greater than what we solved for above, so we know that this H sub D is still okay. Then, let's check our windward condition. You know where I'm going, 716. For windward drifts, the drift height shall be determined by substituting the length of the lower roof for L sub U in figure 7.6-1 and using three quarters of H sub D as determined from uh, figure 7.6-1 as the drift height. The lower roof, LU, is 25 feet. So that means uh, we need to go somewhere kind of in the middle here for the line that we choose. Snow ground is the same as 30. So it's gonna be somewhere, I'd say, between 20 and 30 if I interpolate it. It's gonna be pretty close to the 20 mark, which if we come over here, it's gonna be like 1.6. So let's use that and jump over. Remember, H sub D, it's not the final answer. Over I sub S of 1.2 raised to the uh, 0 0.5 is equal to 1.6 feet. H sub D ends up equaling 1.75 feet. There is a lot going back and forth between the code and the actual problem itself, but that's a big part of uh, structural engineering. We need to remember that is how to be proficient with the codes. And actually, as you get uh, to become a more seasoned engineer, you'll realize, I think that it's less about you spending time figuring out the equations and more about figuring out where the information comes from, what code you're using, what provision you're using, 
Um, that ultimately you brainstorm more about what is my building actually needing to be designed for rather than the equations to solve the problems. Um, that just comes from me, but I'd love to hear from you. If you think otherwise, leave comments always down below and uh, let's start a conversation on that. And then we need to multiply by three quarters, which gets us 1.3 feet. There's both of our conditions and now we need to choose the larger of the two. And obviously that one is our windward condition, which means if we go green and we slide back up, there it is. Answer C is 3.5 feet. I know that paragraph can be kind of cumbersome in the ASCE talking about snowdrift and how to calculate it. But if you're still hazy about snowdrift, I actually have a much more in-depth full length problem for all of you in the channel. So go check that out. Uh, I'll leave a thumbnail up above here. If you haven't subscribed yet, Talk to Jose, he's nudging on the shoulder and he wants you to get in here. And as always, if you like today's content, you know what to do. Give it a like. I don't know personally what that does, but I've been told by some, you know, high up execs in the YouTube world that uh, it's a big deal. So hey, do the little guy a favor and that way hopefully we reach more aspiring engineers around the world and we spread knowledge on how to become a more proficient and better civil structural engineer. This is Rich with Team Kestava, and I will see everybody next time.